and career, and uh, so I enjoy chemistry. And I, I, you know, I can th I think about when you, if you have a test tube and you begin to pour various chemicals in there, some chemical mixes can give you very strange results. Uh, and I'm, I'm trying to apply that kind of to, to uh, character or temperaments. So I, I can't help but, but after hearing the presentations this morning, think about if you, if you poured a mathematician into a test tube and you poured a psychologist into a test tube and you could pour a sociologist into a test tube and mix it all up, you get an economist. <laughs> uh, that's, that's kind of what they have to be. Yesterday we talked uh, about the battle for the mind and determining that we were going to think right about charity. We began to develop the contrast between genuine or true charity and counterfeit charity. We considered why the nature of charity is that it never fails because it never gives up. And we talked about having a healthy worldview. Uh, you know, if you think about health, uh, James can, can tell me later if this is not a good analogy, but if you think about health, our body is healthiest when we allow it to conform to its design. Uh, it's designed in terms of, of care, it's designed in terms of, of uh, diet, it's designed uh, in terms of medical attention. Uh, it, the more closely we conform our body to its design, the healthier we are, and the same is true of a healthy worldview. The more our worldview conforms to the Creator's design, the healthier that world will be. We looked at true charity as a course, not a race, as a relationship, not a statistic. But what do we do now? What should be our expectations? And then what do we do to measure results? Let's go back to that box again. And we talked about thinking outside the box and about how a worldview sets parameters for my reason. Let's consider that box of reason. Uh, thinking outside the box should never violate absolutes. My opinions can be wrong, but absolutes are absolute by their nature. Uh, history can be maybe incomplete or even misunderstood, but we should be very careful about violating history. <clears throat> Tradition is usually rooted in truth, but it doesn't have the same authenticity or authority as absolutes or history. The violation of God's eternal laws, absolutes, will bring consequences even if those consequences are not immediate. They may take decades or even longer for us to realize those consequences. But the violation of absolutes is just as sure with God's laws as it is if you step out of an airplane with no parachute. You may enjoy the, the journey, <laughs> but at the end the consequences will come. You cannot reverse them because it's an absolute. Remembering that there is both true and counterfeit charity, let's take a look at James Madison's view of charity and government programs. Oops, somehow I'm missing a slide here. Well, let me read, let me read this to you. I'm not sure if the slide made it in or not. There, were, there are myriads of quotations by the Founding Fathers reflecting their worldview that government should have no power not granted to them by the people. Probably no one was more qualified to discuss the, the principles codified in the U.S. Constitution than James Madison, the principal author of that document. In 1792, Congress appropriated $15,000 to assist French refugees. Now here's what James Madison said. He wrote, I cannot undertake to lay my finger on that article of the Constitution which granted a right to Congress of expending on objects of benevolence the money of their constituents. He was asked about the General Welfare, Welfare Clause, which today is used indiscriminately. Madison said this, with respect to the words of General Welfare, I have always regarded them as qualified by the detail of powers enumerated in the Constitution connected with them, 
To take them in a literal and unlimited sense would be a metamorphosis of the Constitution into a character with which there is a host of proofs was not contemplated by its creators. Today we live in a world where that general welfare clause is used again and again to justify virtually anything. Those are the views of James Madison. The purpose of the Constitution is not so much to empower government as to constrain it. And that perspective is reflected in Madison's first statement, acknowledging that Congress has, is not empowered for benevolence. Government is an institution. It's not a personality. It has no soul. It has no capacity for relationship, no, no mechanism to dispense charity, only subsidy. And there is a difference between charity and subsidy. Madison, as the primary author, explains that never was benevolence contemplated by the, let alone authorized. If you'd like to deep, dig deeper into the character of government, its nature and pro proclivities, there may be no more succinct nor comprehensive book than The Law by Frederick Bastiat. James quoted a passage from that yesterday in his remarks. So it's, it's a small book. It's well worth the read. If we are a nation of laws, not men, then where is there room for compassion? If we have a justice system that is blind to personal status, of those, to the personal status of those who come before it, then where is there room for deference or preference? There is none. Addressing charity through government is a violation of both America, of America's most foundational principles, individual liberty and economic freedom. So where are we today? It's been said that it's not, it isn't as important where we are as where we're headed, and I believe that that's a wise and necessary perspective. Nevertheless, knowing where we are and how we got there will help us with the journey back. In the United States, we currently live in a culture which is virtu virtually void of absolutes. We have rejected absolutes as a culture. You may not have, I may not have, but our culture indeed has. We've taken the Bible out of public education, We've taken absolutes out of marriage, out of family, out of history. We've even tried to take absolutes out of mathematics. In a government of the people, by the people, and for the people, the absolute of government is the Constitution. We've removed it by calling it living, which is essentially no Constitution at all. Once absolutes are removed from society, there's no truth because truth must be rooted in absolutes. Without truth, we live in a world of opinions. No right, no wrong, just different. My opinion is, is as valid as yours just because I hold it. <clears throat> Without truth, history loses its authenticity, and it can be revised or forgotten. Tradition loses its roots, and we are left in a world of opinions. This is the world in which we now live, and we marvel that there are so many that are, are so hard to win to the truth. There is no truth where there are no absolutes, and in a world of opinions, the tyrant always wins. That's why today, when you get into the world of politics, it isn't about policy, it's about power. It's not about the laws that we make after we're elected, it's about maintaining power while we're elected and through the next election. Because we're better tyrants than they are. But it's all about tyranny because in a world of opinions, only the tyrant will win. If you're not the tyrant, there is no way for your opinion to dominate. In a world of opinions, the truth cannot win because it has no grip. So leadership falls not to the righteous, but to the powerful. Policy becomes secondary to power. Ladies and gentlemen, that's the world that, is seeking, that we're seeking to overcome. And we will, we will, if we want to prevail, excuse me, that's the world that's seeking to overcome us. And will prevail if we fail in reviving the absolutes of life and creation. Well, let's go back to the issue of today's discussion, charity, and the differences between, there's my, there's my slide, <laughs> not sure how that got there, between authenticity and counterfeit. Moving from blind 
justice to social justice, and the consequences of abandoning absolutes. How has our thinking changed since we began synthesizing relationships for government? How does society look at government today versus the views of the founders or even our parents? Patrick Henry on the nature of government said the Constitution is not an instrument for the government to restrain the people, it's an instrument for the people to restrain the government. The, prize bull, a, the Constitution is, is much like a fence uh, that we built around government, that our founders built around government. Uh, I, an analogy I frequently use is if, if, because we live in an agricultural area, is if you have a prize bull, you, you put it in a fence. You keep it in a corral, you restrain it, because a prize bull is invaluable to you as a cattleman. But if it gets out of that restraint, it can be destructive, it can be very costly. Uh, it, it, there's all manner of damage that a prize bull can do once it's outside that restraint. George Washington was invited to be king during the early years of our nation because he was so trusted and respected. And I believe he would have probably been a good king, but still a king. He trusted government no more than fire to restrain itself. A fire must be deliberately limited and constantly monitored for it to be useful. Washington said government is not reason, it is not eloquence, it is not force, and force like fire is a dangerous servant and a fearful master. Luis Brandeis was an attorney who lived in the early 20th century and was considered, considered to be brilliant and possessed great depth of character. He says the greatest threat to our liberty, our way of life, by his estimation was when government proposed to become beneficiary rather than blind architect, arbiter. How did such a radical transformation in our thinking occur since this nation was conceived in liberty and dedicated to the proposition that all men are created equal to the thinking of today. I believe it aligns with the change from seeing government as a threat to be carefully contained or seeing government as our friend. We now, today, we approach government as a trusted friend. We approach government with the idea that it can be a helpful neighbor. We approach government many times as a wealthy partner. Probably the most insidious aspects of abandoning constitutional absolutes is that it encourages citizens to change their view of government. Instead of suspicious suspicion, Americans now view their government as a trusted friend, helpful neighbor, and wealthy partner. We have begun to attribute to it the best attributes of a meaningful relationship. The problem is that this per perceived relationship, relationship is not true, but counterfeit. A counterfeit relationship will not produce charity, but subsidy. Consider how pretending, we, how pretending we can have a relationship to government changes one's view of government's role in our nation and our lives. On whom do I rely today if I have emergency needs? Friends, church, family, neighbors, or government? To whom do I give my most confidential personal and financial information? Family, friends, church, neighbors, or government? Whom do I trust to keep me safe from spoiled food, from dishonest merchants, or poor quality contractors? Who do I trust in my home, unrestricted, to choose my toilet, my light bulbs, my gasoline, or my diet? That's where we are today. We've abandoned absolutes, taken government as our friend, and begun to expect from government what only God can provide. How do we return to one nation under God? The institution that we claim to trust least has become our friend. The nature of government has not changed. We did. <clears throat> True charity never fails because it is a relationship based and always it is relationship based and always has its success as is as its objective. 
Nothing less will do, and charity that is satisfied with less is a counterfeit charity. Are we examining every charitable act for the structure and process that ends in the success? Let's address that with a look at the structure behind true charity and government programs. True charity is relationship charity and by its design equips us to as overcomers in every area of life. Parenting is probably the universal example of relationship charity. If, you're, if you don't have teenage parents you, or children, you may not understand that as well as some of us do. <laughs> Whether baby birds being kicked out of their nest or children being entrusted to marriage or to establishing their own home and lives, parenting is not content to just fulfill the need for food and shelter, but to equip for its independence. True charity will always be relationship-based and will be more concerned with the, with the next adventure than with the next meal. True charity is designed to set a course for success, not just relieve the consequences of failure. Relationship charity will always surpass government programs in effectiveness, but the most successful government programs will always be those that, are, that do the best job of simulating re relationship charity. The building of relationships benefits both giver and recipient. Government subsidies don't benefit anyone. True parenting gives with vision and expectation. Government does not. How does the stru structure of true charity differ from counterfeit? Only in the realm of the divine does charity have a place. Why is it better for a man to share than to hoard, to give than to receive, to encourage rather than condemn? Is it because I think so or you? I asked you that last night. What basis do we have for claiming that charity is good? It's only within the context of a divine plan. That's where we get purpose. We focus on purpose rather than circumstance, on resolution rather than relief, on relationship rather than statistics, on direction not interruption, and on vision rather than subsidy. What's the path back? Too often we fall victim to a reconciliation with the status quo, with our own ignorance, or with the lack of a clear and articulate worldview. We've learned to accommodate counterfeits and to adjust our expectations to meet their inadequacies. We must begin to question everything with a view to the future and to success, not to relief. We have to recognize and acknowledge the objective. The objective is liberty. I love talking about the Declaration of Independence and going back uh, to our founders and, and the, the principles that were captured in that document. That we are in fact endowed by our Creator with certain unalienable rights. We're endowed and we're endowed by our Creator. And among those are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. We go to the end of that document and it's revealed to us what our founders believed liberty was worth. They pledged their lives, their fortunes, and their sacred honor. I'd love to talk uh, at length about that pledge, but let me just say, if you examine those three, ple the, the three issues on those pledge, <coughs> there is nothing else. They pledged everything for liberty. The question we have to answer is what is liberty worth to us, personal and economic. We have to recognize the enemy. The enemy is ignorance and the abandonment of absolutes. I believe that is the enemy. We, that's the first place we see the abandonment of absolutes is in the Garden of Eden. We're in a spiritual warfare. The battle is with the God of this world, and he is the God of ignorance and the abandonment of absolutes. We have to choose our direction. It's not as important where we are as where we're headed. We have to question the status quo, and we have to demand answers about how what we're doing today is achieving success. There's only one ultimate solution in my opinion. If a nation expects to be ignorant and free in a state of, of civilization, it expects what never has, and what never was, and what never will be. It was Thomas Jefferson speaking about education. If you want to change a world, you begin with a child. 
We have to restore local control and competition to public education. We have to somehow take back the minds of our children from the government. We have given over so much control of the education of our children that we no longer have public schools. We have government schools. The government, we have government paid teachers. We have a government directed curriculum and we meet in government supplied buildings. And we wonder why government has become our friend and we're no longer suspicious of it. Would you teach your children not to trust you? I wouldn't. I want them to trust me. Would government teach its children not to trust it? Is there any reason that a distrust of government is not produced in the education of our young people today and that they come out with government as their friend and their government as their friend, that government should help them whenever they have needs, whenever there's emergencies. Government's the one that protects them and provides for them. That's where we are today. For three generations, we've turned the minds of our children over more and more to, go to the government. We've allowed the absolutes of religion, patriotism, family, and government to be removed from curriculum in the names of tolerance and open-mindedness. We've produced a one-size-fits-all socialist system that is dominated by opinions and where the tyrant always wins. If we are serious about restoring true charity in America and replacing counterfeit, we must begin today to restore absolutes and learning to the public school system. The path back is competition in every possible form. There are a couple of books that are very helpful if you haven't examined education and, and considered what we can do to restore the truth of, the, of absolutes to our education system. One is called Let's Put Parents Back in Charge, a very small book by Joseph Bast, uh, produced, published by Heritage Institute. Uh, the other is The Beautiful Tree by James Tooley, totally different in their approaches to education and how they look at education, but the, the message is consistent that until we put education back in the hands of school boards and local school boards and parents, uh, we will not regain the lives, the minds of our children. A beautiful tree is published by Cato Institute. In summary, We must have a healthy worldview, one that conforms to the truth, the truths that are contained in the absolutes of the creator and of history. Success is not a time, it's a condition. Government claims to remove hurdles, charity identifies and fulfills the purposes of the hurdles, of the obstacles. The measure of success is independence versus dependence, and knowledge or education is the way back to true charity. God says his people perish because of lack of knowledge, and, and we do. That's exactly, that's exactly what happens. We perish if we don't have knowledge because we wander around in a world of opinions. True charity is that which aligns with and addresses the most fundamental objectives of charity. False charity is that which is either misaligned with those objectives or fails by nature or design to accomplish them. The differences are contrasted in the charity delivered by private interests and those delivered by government. In my opinion, one is true or genuine, the other is counterfeit. Both attempt to satisfy the immediate need or relieve the immediate discomfort, but counterfeit charity must be content with relief because of the nature of its delivery. Government is not a relationship Justice is blind, and we are a nation of laws. We must not let the world of opinions redefine the character of charity. Charity is, a, is an expression of generosity. Generosity is carefully managing my resources so I can freely give to those in need. I think we have to learn to insist on true charity, on character versus achievement, on design versus reaction, on purpose versus relief, on a path versus an incident, and on an obstacle course versus a race. We must not settle for counterfeit charity. Remember, <laughs> everything will be okay in the end. If it's not okay, it's not the end. Charity never fails. We must not fail. Thank you for your attention.